Hello everyone, it's Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher, jumping on after a two-week layoff with another, well, these are now Canadian immigration Q&As. So they're not just focused on express entry. There is so much confusion, so much uncertainty in Canada right now that people are just not knowing where to go to get the answers that they need. And uh, because of that, it's resulting in a lot of people just experiencing high levels of stress and uncertainty in their lives, especially foreign workers, those of you who have existing confirmations of permanent residence. And there's just, you know, you don't know whether you can travel with all of the bans or even get a flight if you're, tr if you're planning on coming to Canada. And then there's all those people in Canada who have maybe been laid off or their hours have been reduced. They're not sure how they're going to provide for themselves. Are foreign workers eligible to obtain employment insurance benefits to help them, uh, you know, survive to get through until the economy, well, the economy, this this whole uh, COVID-19 situation passes. So um, I'm excited today to make this um, a Q&A that's devoted to all of you. And uh, we have, excuse me, I've been scrambling because I just got off a call Um um, um, <clears throat> with uh, with the immigration practitioners, the organizations in Canada. Um, we are now doing weekly calls with the heads of uh, immigration to try and get clarity on everything that is happening. And there are still so many questions that are unanswered. But today, everyone, those of you who are tuning in live, I want to thank you for joining me. Make sure here on the Canadian Immigration Institute's Facebook page that you share with people um, this link and tag them and pull them in and let them know that this is happening. This is really, really important right now, especially for all of you out there. And uh, I'm broadcasting now from uh, looks like Rio de Janeiro um, here, which uh, one day I'm, I am going to get there. I'm going to move out of the way. You guys got to check this out. Look at that. Whoa, that's beautiful. I'm kind of blocking the whole screen, but that's okay. Anyways, shout out to all of my uh, amazing uh, friends in Brazil. Um, yes, uh, one day I will definitely get there. All right. So with this being said, we're going to hold off on questions just for a second here. Um, in terms of the Holthy family here, what has transpired? Well, I think many of you probably are aware that my, my son, Adam is finally, he's home back from Suriname. We didn't anticipate that he would be making it, uh, that he'd be coming home. He wasn't, he was supposed to stay there for another six months, but as a result of, uh, yeah, as a result of the whole um, lockdown in many, many countries, it was important for him to come home. And there were a ton. I don't know if there were 30,000 or more missionaries that have all been returned to their home countries. And uh, so this is uh, this is just a picture of my son there. And um, he uh, he. Yeah, it's so good to be home. <laughs> well, I think for us, we were super excited to have him back. He is uh, still trying to figure out a few things because he has his, uh, well, our whole family has basically been in quarantine for the last 14 days. So we are just trying to figure out what the future holds. But many of you probably are also, well, not quarantine, but self-isolation just for the protection of others. So that's what our family did. And uh, that's kind of the situation that Adam was in. So super grateful that he's back with our family and safe. Um, uh, Ralph says, Adam, make a nice speech. Yeah. If you guys want to go to my Facebook page, you can, you can listen to my ad, uh, my son give his report. And usually in our church, when a missionary comes home, uh, in our sacrament or Sunday meeting, um, our congregation, they have a chance to get up in front of everyone and speak and, uh, just provide a report on their experience and, um, for their, you know, year and a half or too long, a two year long mission. And so if you want to, uh, see what this mission stuff is all about, you can, Go to my Facebook page, my personal Facebook page, and uh, his uh, because we can't do that now because we're not meeting as congregations. He did he pre-recorded his um, his talk, if you will, and so yeah, so super proud of this kid. He's a good kid, and he's going to be helping me a little bit with it, with my office because he has some time on his hands now. So, all right, there we go. <laughs> okay, so we're back here. Apologize. Actually, this this uh, you can see a little bit of a speckling here. I'll try to keep pretty still with this. I've got my lighting is not perfect and uh, it's starting to snow a little bit outside. But welcome to the Canadian Immigration Live Q&A. 
And that's what these are. I think everybody can probably hear me okay. Um, I am uh, in my home here recording out of my office, which is what my law firm is now. All of the people working for my firm all work out of their offices. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to have you here. Make sure that you send out, um, just tag your friends, let them know that this is happening. And we're going to be going forward here with, uh, let me just see if I can pull up a few things here so we know what we're doing here. So there's those. And those of you who do have questions, remember that you can always go and you can post those. Um, uh, I'll just click on here a couple things. Bear with me. Wow, I've got all of this stuff here uh, that I have been using for a long time. Let's see. We've got this one. So EE Live Q&A is traditionally what the question, at least you, what you'll put into the subject line on your emails in order to get your question through for me to consider in another or the most recent episode that's going to be coming up of our live Q&As. I should probably change this to immigration uh, live Q&A, um, but for the time being, it's still EE live q and I'm just trying to find the email address so I can share it with you. Oh, I've got so many old messages and overlays on my list here and now I'm struggling to find the email that is associated with this and I can't even find it. Boy, what a gong show. It's one of those days. Anyways, I'll figure it out later. Um, the key here is that, uh, let's see, maybe I can create a new one here. That's it all too. You guys know in order to get through, yeah, there we go. Let's do that. Okay, let's see how big it is. That's not too bad. It could shrink down a little bit. So there's the email address right there. So this is how you can send a question for an upcoming EE Live Q&A is by sending it to info right here at wholefeelaw.com and that is how you send a question if you're watching this as a recording, which many of you will be. But those of you who are actually here posting questions, hold off for one second. I'm going to get to all these questions. I'm going to give you guys time so that we can get them answered because I know many of you have a lot of questions and you're just not sure what the world looks like when it comes to Canadian immigration. I'm just getting myself organized because I literally had two minutes to jump from my call uh, with the heads of IRCC and um, ESDC, uh, the conference call that I had, and then get this live and get my picture up. And so a shout out to Igor, who was so kind to help me with an image. And those of you who are posting comments, hold off on your comments because I'm going to be getting to them in just a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, I just want to, to start off by saying that my thoughts and prayers are with all of you guys all over the world who are in situations where you're locked down in your homes, where the future is uncertain, where the, the spread of the coronavirus is, is just really taking over your country. And so my heart goes out to all of you. And I know that um, the one thing I'll tell you that I am so eternally grateful for is to live in a country where our healthcare system is as awesome as it is in Canada. I look to our neighbors to the south and they've got wonderful abilities, wonderful technology, you know, great, great health care um, coverage, but it's not like Canada. And the things that we're able to do here in Canada when it comes to locking down, making sure there's treatment, providing for all of the things that are essential to helping get through this COVID-19 world. Um, I'm just I'm so proud of our health system and the way that we all work together and um you know, with any luck, we're going to get through this quickly. And I hope that the same is for all of you guys. Okay. The questions I could spend a whole discussion on all of the different levels and issues that uh, of changes about travel, who can travel. We can talk about <clears throat> anything. Everything is open. Um, whether you're a foreign worker in Canada with a PNP nomination, wondering what the future holds, because now you've been reduced hours. Um, we'll talk about that. Some things I may not be able to, to answer just because there are no answers yet. But a lot of the things I've got a lot more clarity on it. Individuals that are traveling with uh, confirmations of permanent residence that were previously issued. Individuals that were um, have just received you know, a, a confirmation of permanent residence or better yet, a passport request and now are trying to figure out what they need to do. So everything has changed. March 18th is an important day, but um, you know, with the orders in council, that Canada has issued that dictate who can travel and who, who can't under our uh, Aeronautics Act and, um, you know, just a bunch of different really obscure legislative provisions that they're enacting these directives uh, to block the border. Um, so with that being said, 
we've got a great group of people that are in attendance here. Um, I want you all that are watching to please post in the comment section where you are listening from, okay? So I know there's been a lot of questions that have been pushed out here and we'll go through them, but I want you to let me know where you're listening from. So we've got Steve, he's from Latvia. Great to see you, Steve. Ralph, as always, my best bud, he is here tuning in. Um, Harry's tuning in from Kelowna. Welcome back, Harry. Um, okay, Umer says, may you help me for Canada immigration? Uh, that, that would require... <laughs> <laughs> a paid consult, Umer, but I'm suspecting that you're probably wanting me to somehow sponsor you, which is not something that I can do. Okay, Gokulnath says, hi, Mark. Lucky says, hello. Um, and then we've got a bunch of questions here. Make sure you post comments once again where you're listening from. And let's give people a shout out. Bella, she says, hi. She gives me the, the nice emoticon. I'm surprising people don't have the mask emoticons um, with, uh, <laughs> that they're posting here. Um, let's see who else we have here. Um, uh, we'll get through a bunch of these in a second. There's lots of questions, but let's get down to the que the comments where people are saying where they're tuning in from. Wow, there are a ton of questions. Marshall's in Alberta. Katamba is Uganda, East Africa. Welcome, Katamba. Bell, of course, you're Edmonton. Uh, Golkanath is in Toronto. Meg is Toronto. Ronell's in Alberta. Jazdeep's India. Christine is in the U.S., Wow, uncertain times, guys. Uh, Emeka is uh, Nigeria. Um, hopefully, Mashi, hopefully you've been able to uh, to get some of your PR stuff sort of, sorted out. Um, uh, Koz is in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Hala is Dubai. Michelle's in Kenya. Um, Prakash is in Guelph in Ontario. We've got Mohammed. Uh, thanks for joining in from lockdown in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Um, Marlon's here. Welcome, Marlon. And we've got a bunch of people, Veronica, Slovakia, and uh, Ezra is Kurdistan of Iraq. Uh, oh, there's Bella giving me, oh, she's giving me a laugh, uh, emoticon with a mask. Marlin's in BC. Great. We've got a great group of people. So shout out to all of you guys. Diem is in BC. Ronald, uh, Ronald's in the Philippines. Hal is Dubai. Farzad is Bangladesh. Saim is Saudi Arabia. Birdie is South Africa. This is unbelievable, you guys. People all over the world. Assad is Pakistan. Salma is Honduras. I think we've got every continent except Antarctica covered here. Um, Al is in Dhaka. Camille is Lethbridge. Woo! Awesome. Welcome. Even local people are turning in. Bernard's Lebanon. Asil's Toronto. And uh, awesome. So thanks, guys, for doing that. I really, really appreciate it because it gives other people a chance to realize and feel that we are all in this together. And um, no matter where we are in the world, everybody is experiencing the same thing. And it is making our whole world one global community. Um, we've got Ishan from Texas. Um, uh, Hardeep's Punjab in India. Shafin is the Maldives. Um, Ishan is in Texas. And Katamba is asking for a discount for this pandemic. My friend, do you have any idea what the future holds for an immigration lawyer in Canada? I think that's probably a sufficient explanation. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I just wanted to give a shout out to everybody and thank everybody for tuning in. Um, there's been a bunch of questions that have been sent in by email, but because we have such an amazing group of people that have tuned in live today, I'm actually going to focus exclusively on all of your live questions and see what we can do to try to, to try to demystify some of the issues that we're experiencing right now, the uncertainty with the questions. And so let's just do that. So starting now, so all of you posted a ton of questions. So starting now is where I want you to now post your question. If you posted it before, post it again. Don't post it multiple times. Um, we've got Thota from the US and we've got Uwem from Nigeria. So starting with the first comment that's posted after Uwem in Nigeria, um, I will now start to answer the questions. Okay, so the first one here is we have Steve Hans and he says, I'd like to ask you, what is the possibility to get a PNP nomination from Saskatchewan for 1241 considering one year experience, civil applicant, <laughs> CLV8, and after how long I may call my partner after landing into Canada? Okay, Steve, when you're asking for a specific question that relates to you and your eligibility, that actually fits into something that would require a paid consultation. 
And so I'll have Igor post the link to our new website where you can access the consultations. Um, we're also starting to release blog posts on different things. And uh, so I just want to remind everybody that the questions need to be general in nature for um, that would benefit all of the people that are listening versus having individuals just say, Mark, can you help me to know how to qualify? But I can guarantee if you book a paid consultation, it will be 100% worth your time. The reality is the answers I give you may not be what you want to hear. I may say, Steve, you don't have a prayer. There's no options, but at least you will know and you'll be able to govern yourself accordingly instead of pursuing a dream of immigrating to Canada when the likelihood is very low. So that's as important as anything else in terms of advice. Um, I do want to just take a second here and just flip over and share my screen so that you guys can see what we're talking about here. The website that we've created is consistently expanding and we're trying to improve it. One of the things that we're doing here on the website is, is to create um, our blog post. And uh, this is not SEO optimized or anything, but it's all about content. So Canadian immigration and COVID-19 travel restrictions. My colleague Susan Wood uh, put this together for us. It contains basic information and essential links back to the actual orders in council, the different explanations with respect to how Canada and U.S. are treating each of their own uh, residents, um, how these orders fit, which foreign nationals are prohibited, um, when a foreign national can enter Canada from the U.S. or other countries, uh, and there's a bunch of information that's all in here, including links to all of the major orders and directives and um, uh, different legislative things that have been enacted with respect to entering Canada. So just go to our site, check this out. I'll copy this link and I'll post it into there. And that's one site that you can um, where you can go, which then links to all the other government sites. So go there and check it out. And uh, this site, uh, like I said, our website here is constantly evolving and growing. And so the intention is to, um, is to really make this a great resource for people to get information. The other thing I'll, sh I'll give a quick shout out as well to is we, we've revamped the Canadian Immigration Institutes, um, the DIY guides and things like that. I'm constantly working on new guides right now because I think that's really the future for you guys. And so you can come here and check out this site, which is the Canadian Immigration Institute. It's a lot easier to follow. And uh, thanks for to Igor, who was helping with that. I'll post that in the link as well. Okay, back to the questions. All right, diving in. Okay, now Ross says, Hi, Mark, please update if those who received confirmation of permanent resident get extension. Yes. So understand that if you have received a confirmation of permanent residence after March the 18th or even before March 18th, you can still travel if you can leave your country. But I understand that most people and lots of people are actually restricted from being able to travel. Immigration will be flexible with you. And I don't have the exact link. It'll take me a little bit to search for it. But maybe Igor, if you're watching it, can you post, or Susan, if you are uh, connected here, can you post for uh, Nora um, the link where there are instructions for what you do when you're unable to travel and your confirmation of permanent residence is maybe expiring. You can actually request through the web form um, an extension of time and to notify them that you want to travel but you're unable to do so. So that's what you do, Nora. And depending upon when your COPR was received, and for those of you who are new, that's Nora, uh, Nora actually has received now the confirmation of permanent residence, which allows them to travel and become a permanent resident. But because of everything that's happened, some people are restricted, some are not. And um, But if your confirmation of permanent residence was issued and you had it before March 18th, you are eligible to come and, and apply. You have to abide by certain provisions and things like that. But at this stage, um, it is possible. Um, and if, once again, if you go to the link that we provided there to the blog post that Susan drafted, um, it's full of all of the ac access to all of the information. Looks like Susan's here. She says, yes, I'll get that and post it a moment. Sorry, guys, my, <laughs> my nose is really itchy. I will wash and sanitize myself. But the reality is I'm not leaving my office and all of my family's been together for two weeks now with one more week to go. So don't worry, even though I've got an itchy nose and I'm brushing it, I won't run out and contaminate everybody else. Okay, <laughs> and it sure is an itchy nose today. Okay. Thoda says, next, hi, Mark, is there any way to track PR cards? Well, the reality is when you are uh, submitting your application, I'm assuming, Thoda, to, uh, it's your first one, I'm assuming, the PR card that 
originally um, you, you probably landed and are now in a position where you're waiting for your first PR card, that address of when, where, when they're going to send it and the address where it's to be sent, there is no real way of tracking that other than if you're in Canada, calling the one eight the one eight 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 two four two twenty one hundred call center, which probably is really hard to get through. That's pretty much the only way. If you're in Canada, call that number and say, "Hey, has it been sent? Where is it at?" That's the route. You can also um, you can also send um, a request through the web form, and um, and then maybe uh, Igor, Susan, you can post um, in the link there where um, people can upload requests through the web form, but I'm sure Thoda, you know how to do that. Um, other than that, if you're outside of Canada, um, well, obviously you need to be in Canada to, to receive it. They will send it to a Canadian address, but tracking it is not easy. Um, and in lots of, in lots of cases, you just have to be patient and wait. Igor knows that because he had his original one sent right to my, uh, right to my home office here. And, uh, it took quite a while to get it. Didn't it, Igor? Maybe you can post a comment on how long it actually took to get it. Uh, I can't remember exactly when we received it, but um, it took it took quite a while to receive it. Okay, um, uh, Ralph says, Mark, give always good deals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do, Ralph. Okay, Bochti says, hi, Mark. I would really appreciate if you could answer uh, if I am in the middle of immigration to Canada through the PNP program. Because I live in the UK for a period of time and I'm eligible for applying for UK citizenship, would this two processes interfere to each other? Bochti, no. In fact, I highly recommend that you go forward with your citizenship in the UK and get it, okay? Get that UK citizenship because once you've got it, then you've got it. Then the PR process in Canada, that's not a problem. You can still pursue that. They are not mutually exclusive. One doesn't cancel out the other, all right? But I have to assume, obviously, um, uh, that you are probably complying with whatever the rules are for UK citizenship. You'll need to do that. For Canadian PR, same story. If you're outside of Canada, inside, you just have to make sure that you're complying with the uh, eligibility requirements. All right, next question is from Ezra. <clears throat> it says, thank you so much for your efforts. We do appreciate it very much. You're very welcome, Ezra. Kabir says, when does the five-year mark begin on landing or the day the card is received? Kabir, the five-year mark, actually the card itself, um, you will see the date on the card. And so the five-year period actually starts backwards from the day that you submit your application to extend your PR card. And that's really what it comes down to. Boy, I've got one itchy nose and it's driving me crazy. Um, so basically what happens is you'll be issued your card. It will be, it will be valid for five years. So that's the date that you're going to watch in terms of being able to board a plane and travel. But for permanent residents in Canada, the real important date is the date when you're actually submitting your application to extend your PR card. Because that's the five-year window, that period right there, that they're actually looking at. So from the date that you submit your application, they're looking backwards five years to see if you've lived in Canada and were physically present for at least two years in that five-year period. So that's the one that you want to focus on. Okay, Hardeep says, hello, sir. Embassy is still working on visas who are already done biometrics. Yes, just confirmed today that it is business as usual for IRCC, except for the fact that they have reduced staff. Processing times are going to be slower. The issuance of confirmations of permanent residence, the issuance of work permits, study permits, visitor visas are all going to be delayed because there are just fewer officers. Some will have to go home. Some have to try to work from home. Some are unable to work from home, but they have to self-isolate. So all of those things play a significant role. There, Susan uh, posted the, the link to the IRCC program delivery uh, instructions, which is where you can go to get a lot of answers. And let me just see if I can actually see this. And uh, I wonder if I can pull it up so that you guys can see. Looks like I can see it here, but um, I don't know if I can even copy it. I don't think I can. In my view here, I can't quite open it up, but that's okay. Not a big deal. So Susan posted the link to the IRCC program uh, instruction, um, delivery instructions. Okay, let's see if we can continue forward here with the next question. Okay. Um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. See, that's the problem with um, <laughs> starting to answer questions. Um, okay, let's start here. Let's see, where did I end with? I apologize, you guys. You guys are great. And now I'm like messing everything up here. 
Oh boy, I'm so confused. I've got so many questions and so many people. All right. Um, okay, where did we end off with? You guys are posting way too many, <laughs> way too many comments here. Oh, where did I end off? Okay, okay, there we go. Now we're back on track. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks for your patience. <sighs> As you can see, those who've tuned in for the first time, this is a what we call a rough and tumble presentation. In other words, I'm kind of queuing up the questions. I'm answering them as we go. I'm trying to stay centered in my, you know, in my camera. And uh, there's no fanciness here. You know, I got the big honking zit that's coming here. <laughs> that <laughs> stress causes all kinds of crazy things. I've been putting on a little bit of weight, so I'm feeling a little heavier than normal. I'm used to getting out in the summer and, and being able to ride my bike, but Oh my goodness, it's all just, yeah, it's having good, it, it's been quite the experience. Looks like Susan just emailed me the link, which is great. So I could probably pull that up and show you guys. All right, there it is. Okay, there's the link. Okay, I'll just shift my screen, screen around. This is probably one of the most important sources for you guys to review, okay? So here's the instructions on approved permanent resident applications right here. You can see that um, for all of this, if you're, um, basically this is where the instructions are. So as we talked about before, valid COPRs um, in an effort to reduce the number of canceled, it says a note should be placed in the file explaining that the applicant is unable to travel and the file should be brought forward to the expiration date of the COPR or the PRV, permanent resident visa. If the applicant informs that they can travel prior to the, exp uh, the expiration, they're encouraged to use their existing COPR and PBR, PRV to land. But if it's expired, then you would have had to have informed IRC via the web form that they are unable to travel after the expiry of it. And if they are unable to travel prior to expiration, and officers are to reopen the application and it should be brought forward for review in 90 days. So you can see here that there is going to be discretion. There is going to be kindness. There's going to be understanding. And this is where I wanna give a massive shout out to IRCC because they have been just doing unbelievable things to try to keep this whole world functioning. When all other countries just basically shut down and treat their foreign workers, treat potential new immigrants as just as, as worthless and not important, Canada continues to honor and respect our obligations. And the reality that they just, they, they, they are, are concerned for the well-being of people both inside Canada as well as those seeking to travel. And um, so huge shout out to immigration for all of this. Really, really impressive. Okay, so going, continuing on here. Thanks, Susan, for sharing that with me. Okay, next question here. Um, okay, so Hardeep says, hello, sir. Is the embassy is still working on visas who are already done biometrics? Okay, so we answered that one. Adil says, how long will be the delay for PR and work permit process? There's no way of knowing. Obviously, the government is doing all they can to update the processing times. And I think many of you know, if you are curious about processing times, you can go to IRCC processing times and it will pull up this link right here. And then you can choose what your, you know, the, the type of application that you're trying to find um, processing times for. And so if we go to economic immigration and we'll say we're, we're going through... Um, well, let's say we, we're going through which one would be best. Let's go the Canadian experience class. Okay. And then I haven't applied yet. I have already applied. And then we get processing times. You can see here that they're still listing six months for express entry, right? If you go to temporary residence and you say, how long is it taking for my work permit to be processed from outside of Canada? You select where you're applying from. We'll say, why don't we say India just for the sake of argument and we get processing times, you can see here that it says five weeks. Now, you can see last updated, this is the important date, March 24th. So understand that with all of this, processing times may not accurately reflect any disruptions caused by the novel coronavirus. So find out how you're affected by Cronus right here. And this is where um, they basically kick you back to this specific site that is also another great resource from immigration. And this is Immigration Canada's uh, site where it talks about the, uh, the implications and, you know, the, the impact of the virus on processing. Okay, good question. 
Okay, uh, shout out. I'm Henry of Israel. Welcome. And I'm so sorry, Henry, that I was not able to go and be there in Israel because I, I was supposed to go on an awesome trip to Egypt, Jordan, and then spend over a week in Israel right before our national immigration conference, which was also canceled, um, at least postponed. So shout out to you, Henry. You got a shout out, my friend. Okay, Bella says Mark's work is exceptional. He's always has good pricing and deals. He's worth every cent. He's the best. Bella, you are the best. Okay, Farouk says I'm 37, work experience. Do we have a strong case? Farouk, once again, you need to, um, for anyone who's looking for guidance and direction, and those of you who've, who've had consults with me, you can post in the comment section what your experience was. But the reality is anyone who's in those situations, uh, this is not the right avenue for that because I, there's, it's impossible for me to give you good advice in a live Q&A with hundreds of people attending. What you need to do is you need to go and book a paid consult and in 25 minutes we can canvas everything, answer your questions and actually give you advice as to whether or not you have a chance. Okay. Um, Steve says, I took your consultation. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so we've got a bongo. He says, can I travel to Canada within the next week? This is where those directives and going to the blog that we have on our website right here, the one that Susan, if you go to blog post right here and I posted it in the comments, this blog post from Susan has a ton of information. So the answer to your question depends on so many things, um, Abongo, that we need to know where you're traveling from, what the purpose of your travel is. Um, are you on a work permit? Do you have confirmation of permanent residence? And all of those things dictate the answer that I would give you. So you can go to this article right here and I've posted that a couple times. I don't know if I can actually respond directly to you. Don't think so, but I'll just post the link again um, for those who are interested in getting information on being able to travel and the travel restrictions to Canada. Thanks, Susan, once again for the great article. Okay, um, Love Nish says filing for an EI in Canada will affect will affect future immigration requests. No, not at all. And uh, Igor, uh, my other awesome, um, uh, awesome colleague, has gone through and pulled out a bunch of information. And we're going to be releasing a blog post probably today. I think we'll have it ready to go. Uh, that talks about foreign workers and their eligibility for EI and provides links on where you can request it and how you can access it if you've been laid off by your employer and you're a foreign worker. The short answer is yes, foreign workers can apply. And foreign workers have paid into the employment insurance system while they've had their, while they've worked and paid taxes in Canada. So they should have the right to participate. There are some rules around it um, and there are some restrictions, but um, at its base level, foreign workers are eligible um, to make the request to claim employment insurance benefits while they're in Canada if they've been laid off. So stay tuned, watch the blog post right here on our site, this right here. We're gonna have um, all of our blog posts posted here, so you have to check those out. All right, next question is Ella. She says, for international students, because of this situation, can we work over 20 hours per week on essential services businesses? Thank you. Um, Ella, no, absolutely not. You may not work more than 20 hours. Those requirements continue to be locked in. It's regular school right now. It's coming to a close for many. But even if you're no longer, even if your school is closed, you can't work more than 20 hours on your study permit during a regular, um, the regular schedule for class. And many of you are working online, which is totally okay. Many of you have had reduction to your, your course load and things like that. Immigration is very compassionate about it and they are willing to work with you. Um, but while you're in school, you cannot work more than 20 hours. So don't let in any employer or agent or consultant tell you otherwise. That is something that's very clear. You must maintain no more than 20 hours of work per week while you are in school. Okay, Maria says, um, hello, I will probably receive my post-grad work permit for three years. I have to start work in a knock position, but the job I was working fired me due to COVID. Yeah. My husband's work permit expired in July. Will the government give any extra time in this case? So um, it says you'll probably receive your post-grad work permit um, for three years. Well, once you get it, then you have to obtain a job in a skilled occupation. And it's only that job in a skilled occupation that will allow your husband 
to get his work permit extended with you, the open work permit. So you must be working in a skilled occupation. Um, the work, the postgrad work permit for you, Maria, will be issued. They will issue it. But the issue is proving for your husband's work permit that you are working in a skilled occupation that will allow him to then get the open work permit. If you want to book a consult, uh, Maria, we can talk about this in more detail. But uh, yes, in terms of the, the position, you're talking about a skilled position when you say knock position. Um, and that's that's not the end of the world. A postgrad work permit is open no matter who you're working for. Okay, it's just whether or not your husband is able to get another work permit. And that will depend upon your ability to secure skilled work. Okay, Ralph says, Mark is the best. The cost is 100% worth it. Oh, Ralph, you guys are awesome. You are so kind to me. Okay, Ezra says, do you think the draw for the express entry will continue despite the situation with coronavirus? Great question. And the answer is they are still deciding. So in the meetings that we had today, that was one of the things that they're still working on. And they're not certain if they are going to continue with rounds of invitations. So understand that that is the most current advice that I can give you. We saw a draw for CEC only happen once already, but we do not know and they have not decided exactly what they're going to be doing. So if anyone has a yes or a no answer and is telling you out in internet land that yes, the draws are going to happen, you can tell them all to take a freaking hike because nobody knows right now immigration is still in the process of determining whether or not they're going to continue to issue these rounds of invitations. In my position, I will tell you that if they decide to do it, um, it's going to be a result. Well, the result is that the comprehensive ranking system score is going to drop. It can't do anything but drop. And the reason for that is because no one can get an English test. So traditionally, the, the, the rounds of invitations would be filled up by new people with really high human capital. But unless you can actually write the English test, you're not getting into the pool. And everybody at those higher levels, and let's shift back here and I'll show you guys a few things here just so that you can understand. Because many of you do have questions about express entry. And well, for all intents and purposes, that's what I am. I'm, I am the immigration uh, express entry lawyer. So the rounds of invitations, as you've seen here, um, you can see that they have a bunch of, they've updated the table. Uh, they've... Um, Updating your profile doesn't change the date. They're trying to give you information to help you to understand. But when it comes to the actual round of invitations, you can see right here, and let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger so that you guys can see it a little bit more clearly. There, that's a little bit better. Okay, so if we go here and we look at the rounds of invitations, you can see that on March the 23rd, so about a week ago, there was a draw that was issued only to Canadian experienced class candidates. So not foreign workers, uh, not uh, those who had foreign work experience and lived outside of Canada, but those who had at least one year in Canada of skilled work experience. There were 3,232 uh, uh, invitations issued and um, the pass you can see was 467. So some of my clients in Canada that were kind of stuck at the 467, 468, that were just wondering if they were ever gonna get a draw, they got it, which was wonderful. But let's take a look here at what they've changed now, which is really cool. So now what they've done is they've finally broken down the scores the way they should have been. And the difference is right here, you can see 601 to 1200, 501 to 600 right here, and then 451 to 500. This range right here was never broken down and it was so frustrating, but now we have it. So you can see right now, 451 to 460, yeah, there's a ton of people. And whether or not it'll drop down to that level, we don't know. But 461 to 470, now we're starting to get into a range where depending upon the draws, some of these people that traditionally weren't drawn before could be pulled. But if you look at it as of this day, which is basically March the 23rd, we can see that in the queue, and these people would have been pulled out, right? So, so the draw, this is the date and time was March the 23rd. This is as of March the 13th. So we know that these people have been flushed out. So they've already been extended invitations and even some of these, right? And even some of these because, well, we know how many, a little over 3,000 were pulled out. So some of these 9,000 were even drawn. And in the past, when people were pulled out, new people that just had new English tests and recently submitted their profile were then able to get in and they're often drawn way ahead of all these other people who are stuck waiting and waiting and waiting. But now, because 
people are not able to write English tests. They're not able to get their educational credential assessments. Those of you who are kind of sitting right in this area, 461 to 470, miracles could happen for you. It's possible that if they choose to do rounds of invitations, they're just not going to have as many people um, in the pool because they can't get the the, uh, the IELTS and, uh, and the um, e educational credential assessments. So if they choose to do it, guys, some of you may just see some miracles happen for you. So hang in there, keep your fingers crossed, and we'll see how that unfolds. But very interesting to see how the world uh, is going to unfold. But understand, nobody knows right now whether there's going to be more rounds of invitations being issued right now in the short term or whether they're going to wait for this to blow over before they start issuing new rounds of invitations. So that is where the answer is. Okay, Condola says, can you tell me if spouse in non-accompanying and in Canada on an open work permit, so what we fill in Express Entry should accompany a letter of explanation? Okay, Condola, let me see if I can make sense of your question here. It's a little bit confusing. Can you tell me if a spouse is non-accompanying and in Canada on an open work permit? Oh, yeah, Condola, don't do that. Um, I can absolutely, I just had this discussion with them at our last meetings. And if you were trying to say that your spouse isn't accompanying to get a higher comprehensive ranking system score, and they're in Canada with you on an open work permit, you're going to have a real hard time with the genuineness of that answer. If you're saying, no, they're not accompanying you to Canada, and they're actually in Canada with you. So Condola, I have to, now I'm advising my clients, do not um, try to go down that path because immigration is going to look at it and they're going to question the genuineness of that statement. And in some cases, I've seen people who have had their application refused because um, their spouse was in Canada. So in, in traditionally what happens, you're going to need to have a very, very good, good explanation why that spouse is not accompanying. You need to provide additional, not only a letter of explanation, but supporting documents to show why they're not. And they better be very compelling and clear such as my parents, my elderly parents are, or my spouse's parents are sick because of the coronavirus and she has to go home and care for them. And so she's not going to be able to be in Canada with me once her open work permit expires. Therefore, um, they, um, therefore I'm listing her or him as non-accompanying, something like that. But it has to be compelling. It has to be clear. And you can't just say, oh, I'm listing them as non-accompanying to get a higher CRS score. And those of you who are watching this know how long we've been, you know, operating under this express entry regime. You understand that people who are married are often punished with express entry. Their spouses often don't have as high of language or education. And because of that, it drops the score down of the principal applicant because 40 of those points are attributed to the spouse when they're listed as accompanying. But when you list a spouse as non-accompanying, then the comprehensive ranking system score treats you as an individual applicant. And that's why people do it. But understand, if they're in here, if they're anytime you're listing that, you better be very, very careful how you're explaining it. If you want to book a consult, we can go through it in more detail, Condola. But you must be extremely careful how you answer that. Okay, DM says, could you please tell me, BCPNP now they excluded entry level and some tourism industry. Do you know when they're opening it again? I can tell you, DM, that many provinces are not going to be opening any new programs anytime soon. I know that the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program has four new programs that they're in the process of rolling out. But all of that is pending and, and just they're in a waiting period. Maybe later at the end of this year, they're going to roll out some new programs. But for many, do not expect any expansion of the programs in any significant degree while we're in these uncharted waters of COVID-19. For us, says my COPR is expiring on April the 27th, but flights are canceled by airlines. Yes, for us. Uh, yes, Farzad. I think we actually answered this one for you. Will IRCC extend our validity of COPR and PR visa? Please help us with this as this is the question from thousands like me. The answer, Farzad, is right where Susan provided that link to us. So if you go to, um, let's just open it up here, see if I've got it. I've got a bunch of different links. Let me just open it and then I will shift back so that you can see. Uh, da, 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 da. There's Susan. There's the link. We'll go back to this page. I'll share my screen with you. This is the source of information for you, okay? And like we looked at right here, you can see this is the answer. Approved permanent resident applications and what happens. This tells the officers basically what they're supposed to do. There's more information. This here, these links are... Um, 
this is the program delivery instructions right here. Maybe Susan, you can also find, I know that there's some other links that uh, describe exactly what people are to do from the applicant side of things in terms of doing a web form and actually indicating the problems that you're having. Uh, Farzad, you, issue, you, you submit a web form, make sure you have all your information in there. And in that web form, you're going to explain that you are unable to travel because of the exact reasons you've indicated. Flights are canceled by airlines and they will agree to extend it, the time. They will give you grace period. Obviously, if you're able to get in and fly when it's valid, great. If not, they will make a note of it and you're not going to be punished because of that. Okay. Uncharted waters, folks. Uncharted waters. Okay, Rennell says, currently I applied for an extension of stay until September, which is also the date of my visa expiration. My question, can I apply for a new visitor visa while I'm here because my, my visa will expire soon? If you said you've currently applied for an extension of stay until September, which is also the date of your visa expiration, yeah, you can always apply for a new temporary resident visa. And this is the difference. Stay in Canada as a visitor, a worker, a student is based on the actual permit that's issued to you or the visitor record or, although they're not doing it a lot now, the stamp and the passport. But what Ronell is asking about is the, the actual visa that's imprinted in the passport to allow Ronell to travel abroad and to come back. You can always submit the application, um, but understand they always want to know that you have status in Canada and a reason for them to issue the temporary resident visa, the TRV, in your passport to travel out of Canada and back. Uncharted, time, uh, uncharted uh, waters, once again, Ronell, but you can, you can submit that. Okay, Golkanath, welcome back. All right, Golkanath says here, let's open this up. Uh, it says, I've received AOR on March, this, uh, on March the 16th, 2020, and there's no updates yet. Is this normal? Have IRC stopped processing? No, they have not stopped processing. Um, they understand that the acknowledgement of receipt, which many people have also received um, because they're still issuing them, um, they haven't stopped processing, but the reality is everything has been slowed down because officers that are unable to work, the difficulty working in a secured environment from um, an officer's home, they've always worked traditionally in the embassies or in the processing centers themselves. And so they're working through all of these issues to try to continue processing it's business as usual, but they have far less officers that are able to actually do this. Okay, just give me one second here. I'm just going to go to the next question. Uh, let's see here. Okay. <clears throat> there we go. Just checking out my timing. Looks like I do have one consult today at 3.30. So we've got lots of time to keep talking and answering questions. Okay. All right, Umer says, I am at post AOR stage. Are PR applications outside Canada still being processed? Should these be processed with no processing times? Yes, being processed, Umer. No, they're not likely going to be meeting normal processing for the simple, simple reason, as I've indicated, excuse me, over and over again, there just are not as many officers that are able to process those applications. And so, of course, processing times are going to be reduced. Okay, all right. Next is Lobnish says, I want to sponsor my parents next year, but I'm applying for EI because of this pandemic. Will it affect my file next year? Well, understand that they haven't explained at all what the requirements are going to be. Based on the past, you need to provide notices of assessment from Canada Revenue Agency that show you meet the minimum income level for each of the years preceding the date that you're actually submitting that expression of interest whenever it opens to sponsor a parent. So it is in, So we don't know how they're going to be treating this. We don't know if there's going to be a relaxing of the eligibility requirements for sponsors because of the coronavirus. It's possible that they could make a decision to do that, but until we see a program directive, uh, a policy announcement, um, it's just uncertain times. And so that's something we're just we don't know about. And you've seen they've suspended the parent and grandparent program right now, and. Um, and so we will just have to wait and see. Okay, Max says, Hello, Mark. My application processing bar shows 91% completed, but no background check started. Nothing happened. I came to know from different groups. Oh, seriously? Why are you even listening to different groups? This is the group that matters. And the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group, that's the one that matters. I came to know from different groups that everything is on hold now and the processing will start after June 2020. Is this true? <laughs> Processing has continued. 
And the reality is anyone who says that it's not, well, where are they getting this information? I just got off a conference call with the heads of immigration and they've indicated that processing is continuing, albeit at a drastically reduced rate because of the officer compliment. So they never said they're stopped processing any applications, including express entry. They're sorting things out. They're trying to figure out exactly what they're going to do. But starting on in June 2020, um, no, that's simply not correct. Okay. But slowing? Yes, absolutely. Okay, we're going to pass on Mana who says he needs to live in Canada. How can he come to Canada? Book a consult, Mana, and I'll explain everything for you. Ishan says, thanks for the QA session. For non-accompanying visa officers, scrutinize applications more rigorously. Um, yeah, absolutely they do, Ishan. If you're listing someone as non-accompanying within your express entry application, in particular, if that spouse is with you in Canada, they do look at this and they do want to make sure that there are a reason because it asks, right? The form asks, why is your spouse not accompanying you? And you better have a, a valid reason that is not to get more CRS points. Okay. Um, okay, let's see here. Bernard also says, hi, Mark, my EAPR is processing. Do you think the expected completion date on the portal will be pushed further because of COVID? Yes. It, yes. Should I rely on the bar of completion in the portal? No, don't. That bar in, in many respects, Bernard, doesn't even exist on more current express entry applications. It was just a joke that they put in. Well, it's not a joke, but it was just ridiculous trying to reduce the number of people making calls into IRCC. Uh, you know, so they created this bar that basically advanced based on the actual time in months. You know, when you submitted your application, the bar showed six months. And if it had been three months since your application was submitted, your bar was halfway. If five months, then your bar was almost to the end. And then at six months, it would be, your bar would be completed at six months and said, and then you would have this statement that says, which many of my clients have, processing of your application will take more time than anticipated. And that's what you see. So ignore that bar. It serves no purpose whatsoever. Okay. All right. Continuing down. Um, let's see here. Are we exempt of travel restrictions as pending cases in case we get accepted? you have to look very carefully at the exemptions. It depends on so many factors. That's not something I can tell you right off the bat, Bernard, but go to the link, review the links that we have, review Susan's blog post, and the answers will be in there. Okay, and the reason I can't answer yours specifically is because I don't know exactly what you're talking about. You know, in terms of leaving and coming in, travel restrictions are not just Canada, but they're other countries too, and airlines. And with all airlines, take for instance, um, the. Uh, um, our Air Canada, they just announced that they're going to be laying off, I don't know what it was, 17,000 workers or something like that. Like everything is ground to a halt. So immigration is one factor, but the re practical realities of border closures and closures in other countries also impact and all of the decisions that are being made. Okay. Um, Jazdeep says, what could be the timeline now who are already, who already received your acknowledgement of receipt? Nobody knows. We really don't. Even the, the timelines that they post on their website, you can see they all have caveats that say, you know, these processing times may be affected by the COVID-19. And so I can't answer that, Jazz Deep. We just don't know, my friend. Okay. Rami says, my passport is multiple entry exit stamps, which are not in English or French. So while submitting my passport document, do I um, have to provide a translation for these stamps? I can tell you, Rami, that rarely have I ever done that. But technically speaking, if you have a stamp that's not in English, then it would not be a bad practice for you to actually get that translated. So in your situation, I take no chances. Even if it's a stamp and a passport, which in and of itself may not be a critical part of the application, <clears throat> um, I, would, I would counsel you to go ahead and do that. Many others may not, but I don't deal in probabilities. I deal in possibilities. And if there's a possibility an officer wants to see what this stamp relates to, if it matches up with your travel history for whatever reason, they can't understand, like the, the stamp hasn't been translated. They are looking for every reason in the world to refuse your application. And so I don't take chances. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so Hale's from Pakistan. Welcome, so Hale. Um, okay. Steve says, would the e-draws be delayed? So we've answered that question. Um, Everybody's asking, will there be another draw next week? We've answered that one. 
Um, and then even Alamine says, will there be a time in the near future when the cutoff for EE will come down to 460 because of COVID? Or will the immigration be mainly PNP focused? Well, understand for, for your scores, if you're at 460, anything's possible. <coughs> if they chose to do another round of invitations, like I just finished explaining, Alamine, it's entirely possible that the, the CRS scores could drop down because there are just no new candidates that are coming in who have not yet already obtained an educational credential assessment or the IELTS test. Now, government did indicate that they're working on different ways to collaborate with um, the educational credential assessment agencies and with IELTS in order to, and really even CELPIP, to allow for electronic transmission of the results, which are in place to some extent already. But it's more the testing and the fact that tests are done in person. And that's the issue. So if you already have your profile in the pool, it's possible. Okay, um, let's see here. Ziad says, hi Mark, I'm an approved PR and I've been unable to travel. Yes, due to the borders being closed, first in Canada and now in my home country. What do you think will be the process for extension? Um, Ziad, uh, I'm not quite sure what your question is. If it's extending your permanent resident card, maybe if it's expiring. Um, if you're unable to travel due to that, there's going to be discretion and in like manner, I would send a case specific inquiry. I would put it on record on your file saying that you want to come back, but you can't. Your permanent resident card is expiring. And in your situation, if your permanent resident card expires, then you have to apply for a permanent resident travel document, a PRTD. And that travel document will then allow you to return to Canada if your current PR card is expired. Um, now understand, during that PRTD application, they will assess your residency to ensure that you've met the two years and five year rule that every PR has to meet in order to maintain their permanent resident status. Okay, Marlon says, Mark, if the work permit holder LMIA has been laid off, um, is the company will hire them back? If not, can the work permit holder apply for an open work permit to look for a new job. Marlon, right now, no. There is no provision right now for them to grant um, uh, current foreign workers an amnesty to apply for an open work permit. Everything's on the table right now because they don't know what's happening. They don't want people to be destitute, right? They want people to be able to have opportunities. And some of the benefits like employment insurance, if you were laid off, Marlon, you may be eligible for that. Um, so you want to consider that there's also those emergency measures that are also being made available. And at this stage, we've heard no word that some of those emergency measures are not also going to be available to foreign nationals. Citizens and PR, of course, but foreign nationals may also be eligible for some of those provisions. So um, they haven't listed at this stage any any exclusion. So um, you will be able to, we're going to produce uh, uh, some more blog posts on that topic as well as we go forward. And so stay tuned, watch our site. Those of you who are tuning in a little bit later, <clears throat> all you have to do is go to our Healthy Immigration Law site right here. And blogs are going to be re released all the time right here. The current one we have is travel restrictions and how they impact um, uh, foreign nationals and permanent residents and citizens. So you can check out this blog. It says by Mark Holthy, but it's actually Susan Wood and we need to get that one changed. <coughs> Excuse me. So we'll definitely update that. And um, and Susan did a great job on this blog post. So we're definitely gonna get that changed there. I just noticed it, we just released it and it says by me, but this is, this is Susan Wood's handiwork. So shout out to Susan. Okay, uh, moving forward. Sarbjeet says, hi Mark, my application is 98% complete. Still reviewing eligibility and I send some supporting documents sometime back. No update. Seems like the application is lost in a black hole. What should I do? Wait. That's all that anyone can do. And Sarbjeet, consider yourself extremely fortunate that it's even at that stage. Think of how many people in the world right now have no clue what the future is going to hold for them. So take that into consideration and, um, and just as patient as you can be. Okay. Uh, Lila says when the PNP program will reopen in 2020, we don't know. All the PNPs have all different kinds of processing. They're not closed. Like Alberta right now is still taking applications uh, if you're in Alberta. But the issue is for those of you who are outside of Canada and hoping to rely on the PNP to get a nomination when you're not in Canada, it's going to be interesting because with all of this COVID stuff, I want you guys to understand something, okay? This is really important. 
So there are not only immigration factors at play here, but economic factors. Those are, are overlaid on top of the horrible health and safety of Canadians and the global, really the world. All of those factors are all interlaced. And what Canada is trying to do first is the protection of public, right? And then the security of the country. And my goodness, we are going to be going into significant debt with these measures to help individuals, families, businesses survive through these uncertain times. And the reason our Canadian government is doing this and issuing these programs and these special measures um, to help top up small business and things like that, they're trying to keep businesses afloat so that they don't close. And then more Canadians lose jobs. But so many people are being laid off. And we don't know what the impact of this is going to be on our immigration programs. We don't know if our levels planning is going to have to be adjusted and we're going to take fewer immigrants. We don't know if we're going to have to take more immigrants. We don't know if, you know, what the impact is going to be on the Canadian economy. But I can tell you from a, as a small business owner, which I am right now, I have many colleagues across the country that are laying off their staff. And maybe things will pick up. Maybe they will be rehired. Maybe there will be way more opportunities and, and lots more jobs. But there's going to be a lot of businesses that do not survive this. Businesses that employ Canadians that will close their doors forever. And those people, those Canadians will be looking for jobs. And I can tell you, they're going to be much more willing to work on a farm, to work in food processing, to work in food service or retail. And so... We don't know what the future is going to hold, but understand um, it's, you know, the PNP programs are all based on economic establishment and the need for a foreign national to be able to show that they have a job or they have a, an ability to economically establish in that province. And if there's no jobs in your industry, you can't show that you have, um, you know, a job or work or an ability to support yourself. That nomination, if you're in Canada, is going to be potentially in jeopardy. Now, we don't know exactly how this is going to play out. Every province is different, but it's a reality and you have to be aware of it. For those of you who are outside of the country and you're hoping to rely on a PNP program, we're just going to have to play a wait and see and just watch it unfold. But no one knows, not even the provinces, because we just don't know how long this is going to last. Deeran says, is it worth to immigrate to Canada now, given that the economy is bad due to the COVID-19 epidemic? New newcomers may not get jobs. That is a very astute observation, Deeran. The reality is, what are you going to do if you don't apply? Let's be serious. If you're eligible now and you have the potential of getting an invitation to apply, you might be older in two years and no longer be eligible. If there is a program and there's a possibility, you can always move forward, land in Canada when things are, you know, actually when you get it approved. And if you need to go home, you can do that. And you still have a little bit of time and flexibility to determine whether or not you actually can get a job in Canada and what the economy looks like in one or two years or three years, depending upon where you're at in the process. So, Dearn, I think it just comes down to people. It, dep it depends on your unique circumstances. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen with COVID. But, you know, I would be honest um, with the way the rules are. Can you afford to just sit and wait for two or three years? Maybe you no longer qualify. Maybe this is the only opportunity you can so I would never, ever advise people not to apply. And I'm not just saying this because I'm an immigration lawyer and hoping that people are going to use me and this is my livelihood. I've got other things going on. If immigration doesn't work out, trust me, I have a backup plan. And one of them is an awesome company. And I'm actually going to show you guys just so that you can see what else I have going on. And this one's kind of fun, uh, which is really random because I don't usually talk about these things. But... Um, <laughs> I'm going to open up this page here. Right here, you will see is uh, my little company with my brother and a good friend. And it's called 3B Energy, Three Brothers Energy. And it's all about solar and renewable energy. And so we are in full mode going forward, um, building uh, solar farms, building um, the ability for communities to be self-sustaining. <clears throat> to not have to rely on anything, the oil and gas industry, you know, the, their, you know, anything just for people to be self-sustaining. That's what our whole goal is here for people to be independent and able to, to survive no matter what the world is going to have in the future. And I think you guys all understand when it comes to 
um, when it comes to this, who, who could have even expected that any of this would have happened? I don't think people could have ever env envisioned it, right? But it's here. It's a reality. And everybody knows how volatile everything we thought was. You know, how vol so I should say how volatile the world is and the economy and everything. And so it was a little bit of a side rant. But understand, when I say you should still keep applying, I mean that genu genuinely, not from a self-interested standpoint, but from the interest of yourself. What is your country going to look like for jobs? Like, let alone Canada. And so as far as I'm concerned, it's business as usual. If you qualify, absolutely apply. If ultimately it doesn't work out and you can't find a job, then you go home, right? You, If you have better opportunities in other countries, then you pursue them. But I'd rather take a bird in the hand than two in the bush. In other words, hoping or just assuming that things aren't going to work out. Wait a minute, maybe that analogy didn't really work very good. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is I'd rather take the opportunity now and then just expect that it's still going to be there in two years and it's not. Okay, wow, this is kind of fun, isn't it? Okay, hi Mark, thanks for this live session. I want to sponsor my parents. Okay, so I've already answered that one. Uh, Paul says, I got my work permit on February the 6th. May I travel now? I am an Indian citizen. Paul, this is a perfect, perfect explanation. This is a perfect question. Absolutely ideal. So you got your work permit on February the 6th. So if you look at the directives, one of the issues that we're dealing with right now, immigration, IRCC, it's business as usual. If you have a work permit, you can travel. But on top of IRCC's requirements, well, I shouldn't say travel. You've got a work permit. You're eligible to work in Canada. But on top of that is interlaced this whole world of, um, of the travel bans, these, um, these um, uh, policies, these orders in council, they call them. And so I recommend, um, Paul, that you take a look at the blog post that Susan wrote on our page. Um, and there's only one there now. So go there, take a look at it, and it will show if you're actually able to board a plane. You're coming from India, right? So are you actually going to be able to board a plane? And then it comes down to this concept of are you performing an essential service? And the reality is you haven't indicated what your work permit was for. And how do you argue whether or not you, what you're coming in to do is essential? Something that is not essential, um, like coming to visit a family member or a holiday, obviously, you're not going to be allowed to board if you're a foreign national right now over this short period of time in which these orders in council are in place. Um, but it comes down to what you're planning on doing. Essential service, yeah, you can travel. If you can board and you can get here, you can. If you if you're, uh, the work that you're doing is considered to be essential. And ironically, this is something that we had a discussion with just today with immigration, and we have not... Um, uh, we haven't received a lot of instruction on how broadly they're going to interpret it. Now, we'll see in the coming days as they release further information. Maybe I'll be able to give you a bigger answer. But at this stage, Paul, we're kind of in limbo, uh, except for if you can truly show that you're an essential service. Yes. Okay. Uh, Maria is now asking for some clarification. I mean that because he is in a coordinator position, and if I can't extend to him because I can't find a job in knock, he would lose his position. Yeah, he would. He actually, he actually would lose his job. It wouldn't he lose his job is as much as he wouldn't get a new work permit, right? He could extend as a visitor, but your situation, Maria, with the postgrad, when you're on an open work permit, you have to prove to immigration that you're actually working in a skilled occupation. It's that if you're the principal and he has a, an open spousal work permit based on your skilled work experience in Canada, you have to prove that your experience is skilled. Simple as that. And if you can't, then he can't get an open work permit. Okay, Michelle says, hey, Mark, I hope this is a good question. Or I hope this is a general question. Um, okay, kind of let me know if I can put two different NOC codes in Express Entry Profile to gain more points. Mind you, the two different NOC codes have two different skill types. One of the NOC code is skill type B and the other NOC is skill type C. Okay, simple answer, Michelle. You're never going to put NOC C into Express Entry because you're never getting any points for it. When it comes to your primary knock, you always have to, to select one that is going to be the determiner for whether or not you meet the eligibility requirements for the Federal Skilled Worker Program or the Canadian Experience class. Generally, you know, at a minimum, that's one year of skilled work experience. So that has to all be in one knock. After you've met the eligibility requirements for the Federal Skilled Worker Program or CEC, you can use other knock codes to show other work history that uh, can be used to 
meet your full um, uh, work experience for the comprehensive ranking system. And when it comes to uh, work experience, foreign work experience, you're maximizing your points with three years. So once you've got three years of, of skilled work experience for the purposes only of express entry, you're maxing at three years. For the federal skilled worker program, six years plus, you can get points towards the selection grid within the, the selection criteria within the federal skilled worker program up to six years of work experience if you need it. But skill ski, no. You're gonna list it in your personal history section, yes, but not work history. Hey, an express entry question, how about that? Okay, so Igor, oh, finally we're to Igor. He says, I landed on February the 10th and the cards arrived only on March the 23rd. So there you go, over a month. And just with that, I wanna show you guys this, okay? So we flip our screen around. Let's see if we still have, I'm not sure, I don't think I have the actual, um, so here's that. Uh, let's go here. I'm gonna to go to IRCC Processing and we're gonna take a look at this. So this is where reality meets, um, meets what the government is saying. So if we go permanent resident cards, did you submit? Uh, I'm renewing. No, I'm waiting for my first card. And if you click get processing times, you can see right here, it says 13 days <clears throat> to receive your new PR card. How long did it take Igor to get his? Landed February the 10th. Cards arrived March 23rd. So this is not accurate. And you can see here it was last updated March 8th. Well, that was just before all craziness happened. But the there's just been so much that has transpired. Um, these, we can no longer rely on these as being 100% accurate. But what else do we do? Okay, um, simp score decrease when, says Ambi, likely not happening anytime soon. Um, okay, Nora says, thank you, Mark. How about if there's no travel restriction, but do not wish to travel because of global pandemic? I have two kids and cannot risk their lives of traveling. So will I get an extension? You make the pitch, Nora. You make the pitch. And if those are realistic reasons why you can't travel, it all relates to COVID. It's not just flights and an inability to get flights or border closures. If there is a, a reason that relates directly to, excuse me, the global pandemic, then you make your pitch. And if you, you know, and then you're leaving it in the hands of that officer. So there's no guarantee. Um, Okay, so Maximus says, Hi Mark, just received the nomination from Manitoba. I'm waiting for the express entry draws. Any information? Okay, so I think we talked about that. We don't know when the next draw is going to be. Um, it will be in April if it is, so they're considering it. Obviously, we are just about in April now. Maybe we already are. I can't remember what day it is. I guess it's the 31st. Um, so yeah, keep that. Uh, just keep watching. We'll see what happens with it. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then Ansar's got a question that is related specifically to him. So Ansar, you'll need to book a, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a paid consultation for me to uh, answer your question whether or not you're eligible for immigration. So anyone who has a question about eligibility, I offer 25 minute consultations <clears throat> and I charge uh, $210 Canadian inclusive of our sales tax for those consults. And they're a video consult just like this. You see me, maybe not the, uh, you know, the Christus or whatever it's called, um, Christo Rey, I can't remember what it's called in in Rio, but the statue here behind me, you probably won't have that view, but uh, understand that you actually do, um, uh, you'll, you'll get to see exactly what you see here and we cover everything. We'll take a look at what your eligibility is, Ansar, and, uh, and I do those every day. In fact, I have another one at 3.30 here. Um, <clears throat> okay, Steve says, after how long I can call my partner once I landed in Canada? Okay, so basically, if you listed your spouse as non-accompanying, you need to you need to land. I always recommend to my clients, unless they have a very good savings, that they show they have the ability to economically support their spouse when they come. And uh, in an ideal world, you would have a notice of assessment that you've showed you've already paid taxes in Canada, and a reference letter from an employer. The tax issue you can usually get around, but unless you have a large amount of uh, savings, I really like to show that you also have a job. And so that's really it. Once you've landed, you've got those things in place, you can turn around and sponsor immediately to sponsor your spouse. And that's happening a lot these days. And within our firm, we um, we offer 100% um, support for all of these individuals, express entry uh, candidates who've recently landed and now wanna sponsor their spouse. That's something that we do all the time. And we're more than happy to help you walk through that process. And 
I think many of you probably are just becoming aware of how we operate. So, <clears throat> excuse me, our firm is all about what we call immigration representation done better. And it's all about supporting you in your effort, <clears throat> excuse me, to file your own application. And so by providing you with the support that you need, um, and I'll just click on our approach here, it's entirely client-centered and firm-supported. So what that means is we work collaboratively with you in order to help you file your own application. We cut out the middle people. We cut out the paralegals. We cut out uh, the assistants. We cut out all the people who really don't care about your application as much as you do. And we provide you with the support that you need um, so that you can file your own application. And you can see here, just as I've explained here in the website, we everything that we do is designed to ensure that you have the best experience possible. Our support is that we give is unlike anything in the market because why? Because we truly care. And it's all about collaboration, the latest technology right here, and a truly unique process for our clients. And as long as you're willing to do your part, we actually are able to charge quite a bit less than what our competitors are in the market for direct access. And uh, I'll just go back here for direct access with us immigration lawyers. And that's the model that we that we apply and we absolutely love and it's completely transformed the way I, I do my practice. Okay, we'll scroll down some more. Um, Nara says, Mark, please update. Will I have to do PCCs or medicals again for COPR extension? It's entirely, yes, they haven't waived any of those mandatory security and background requirements, but they will delay them. And so as you're working through this whole process, um, you may be able to submit an application, but eventually they will come back and want you to complete those things. So your, your application process is likely going to be delayed until the ability to have those things completed or to get them, but they're likely not going to just waive police certificates and medicals. That's not going to happen um, unless bearing something crazy, right? But right now, there was no indication in the call that I had uh, with the heads of immigration today um, that they were willing to do that. They're exploring all kinds of different things, but that's not on the table right now. Um, okay, uh, Sedant says, I'm on a work permit in Canada. My spouse is in India. My spouse has plans to travel to Canada in April, and I'm not sure about her entry into Canada if she, if she can travel, as foreign workers are exempted from immigration restrictions. Okay, so um, you don't indicate here if your spouse is on a work permit, so I'm not sure. Um, uh, right now with dependents, we're waiting further instructions. Dependents of foreign workers, you know, whether or not it's considered essential. The rules are designed to facilitate the reunification of families. They don't want people apart. But there's a lot of um, inconsistency and they're sorting out exactly how not just immigration sees things, but the instructions that are being given to airlines and the instructions to the border officers, because there's three levels here now that we're trying to coordinate. We have our immigration officers who are approving the work permits or the study permits or whatever the immigration application. We have the airlines who are trying to interpret this as to whether or not they will actually board you. Because understand, there are massive fines to airlines if they get it wrong and bring someone or board someone that shouldn't have been boarded. And so they're erring on the side of caution and not granting boarding in many cases. And then finally, the Canada Border Service Agency also has the ability to turn someone around and not admit them if they are if they feel they're not admissible. So all of this is still up in the air, Sedant, and I can't answer it. I actually recommend, you know, that you keep watching and let's see how things unfold in the coming weeks. Okay, uh, Christina says, can you please give us a link for your e E2E Express Entry Recorded tutorial? I'm going to register my e profile soon. Um, okay, I think, Christina, I think you mean uh, the, I think what you mean is, let's see, not 3B Energy. Uh, I think it's this one, okay? So right here, all of you that are attending and watching this live, you can go right here. Uh, this is the new site. You can check out the courses that we have. The one course that is um, the, the most popular is this one right here, which is the Express Entry complete step-by-step -step course to doing it yourself. And so if you click on purchase now right here, oh, looks like we've got a little bit of a broken link there. We'll have to update that. Okay, we'll click on learn more. Let's see if we can get it here. Oh, we have another broken link. 
Well, there you have it. I guess we'll have to update some of our links. Let's see if we can find it through another means here. Um, wow, I guess Igor will have to jump on that and upload it. <laughs> we'll have to fix that broken link. The reality is with this, uh, with the guides and everything, um, I wonder if there's a different way to access it. Let me just see, give me a second here so I can show you guys. There's probably another link that maybe can bypass it. Subscribe to the course, maybe it's this one. Ah, oh, okay, well, we'll need to, <laughs> it doesn't do any good to, <laughs> to have a course if people can't ac actually access it. So uh, I know Igor is probably frantically working on it right now that he's realized the links don't work. But anyways, this is where it is. And if you guys, and I'll just type in right here, if you type in EEDIY50, that's the coupon code. And I'll put, I'll put it in the comment section here. Uh, coupon code right there. Okay, I posted it in the comment section. Once you're able to access this, you will have a link where it will, it's a paid course. Um, I spent hundreds of hours creating it and it is designed to help all of you guys really do it on your own. And um, it's full of a video course for every section, detailed instructions on every part of the profile, the EAPR, all the way through. And with that code, you'll be able to get it for $248.50, I think it is, uh, US. So that link to the course will be there and it will be up and running here shortly. Okay, thanks for asking though, Christina. And you can also send me a direct email and I'll, I'll find a way to get you access to it if we're having a little bit of trouble, which we just moved over to this new, this new um, little platform. So we'll have to figure out that broken link. Okay, um, all right, Mina says, okay, hi Mark, as you know, my family and I have COPR and ready to land. We live in the US. Yes, I understand you're undergoing treatments. We're afraid that landing might cause an interruption in receiving medical care. Can I land with my children and leave my wife to continue treatments and then follow us? Yes, you can. 100% you can, Mina. You can do that. Um, there's no restrictions at all. You just need to monitor her. Um, you just need to monitor the expiry on her confirmation of permanent residence. Uh, let's see your question. If her treatment continued beyond the expiry, can I sponsor her uh, when the treatments are done? Um, federal skilled worker, accompanying spouse. Yes, you can. You can absolutely do that, Mina. And that is that's a, an, that is a possibility that you can pursue. Hang in there. My prayers are with you and your family. I know this is such a hard, hard time for her, especially with her, her medical care and everything that she's going through. And um, yeah, my, my, my prayers and my heart go out to you and her and that, that she has a speedy, speedy recovery. Okay. All right. Now we'll go back to Paul. Um, okay. In PR processing, only the security is left. I called on January the 30th. They told me that only security is left. So CIC Sydney, Nova Scotia is working um, now. A days, will it take a long time to get? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so understand, Paul, that yes, um, everything will be delayed including security, because there's just fewer people um, that are able to work a full shift like in the past. Okay, um, yeah, Ralph says, snow, snow, no spring. Yes, indeed. Okay, uh, <laughs> Bella Bella says she, <laughs> Bella's, haha, Mark, you know who to go to for the weight loss. You're right, you're right. Okay, Darko says, um, yeah, will there be a draw next week or next few weeks? Um, in terms of government pausing the program, the processing of applications are continuing. What they're trying to determine is whether or not they're going to continue issuing rounds of invitations and what they will look like. So knowing that express entry, um, knowing that um, within express entry, language testing and the educational credential assessment agencies, <clears throat> both of those that administer those essential components are not doing anything right now. They've suspended it. Um, immigration is just trying to figure things out. Personally, I think they should keep issuing rounds of invitation and pull in the people with lower CRS scores <coughs> who are in a position to continue um, moving forward. That's my position. Okay. Um, all right. Let's, uh, we've got lots of don't skip my question and answer my question. Okay. Uh, Sargil says our psychologist still needed. Sargil, the labor, um, the labor force data that we have, the the skill shortage data that we have, everything is completely un, in flux now. N we don't know what's needed and what isn't. 
Uh, well, we do. Like when it comes to food processing, when it comes to agriculture, um, we did receive confirmation that employers now, especially through the seasonal agricultural worker program, bringing in um, workers um, under those specific programs to make sure that that um, the, our food production and our food cycles, all of those um, abilities continue to be maintained, which are critical for, for the survival of any country. So those are considered essential services and those are conti will continue to, to be facilitated and prioritized by the government. But psychologists, you know what? I would argue that they're absolutely an essential service now given what everybody is dealing with. But whether or not it, it would meet the requirements of one of the PNPs, um, that I can't tell you, my friend. Um, okay, so uh, Mecca Francis Machi says, I am set to join you, Mark, when my country lifts the travel ban. As for your consultation, words can't express... Oh, uh, these ones, I'm, I'm reluctant to read these ones because it just sounds like I'm trying to pick out the ones that are just very kind. But you are very kind, Machi. He says, um, as for your consultation, words can't express the satisfaction and fulfillment I got from it. I will be sharing more whenever I join you live on this platform. But your guidance proved to be perfect and awesome. Thanks a million. You're very welcome, Emeka. And and once we get everything set up, um, I want to show you guys as well within the, the actual site. Uh, well, it's probably on the YouTube channel now. Um, once you get to the, once it opens up and the links work, <laughs> it's quite funny. I'm actually just chuckling here because um, uh, obviously, uh, you know, we're, we're a bunch of amateurs trying to make this stuff work. And um, yeah, so it's all good. Okay, so yeah, I will say, if you're wondering who this uh, Mecca Francis Machi is, you can go to my YouTube channel and you can actually see his testimonial. <coughs> because um, Machi actually, um, not only did he book a consult with me, but he also was one of the early subscribers to the course. And uh yeah, I love my Canadian Immigration Institute graduates like like Machi, who has his confirmation of permanent residence is just getting ready to travel. Okay. Um, okay, Lovnish says, thanks for answering the first question. I applied for my wife's permanent residence and it's been two months. We haven't received an acknowledgement of receipt yet. Is it something we should be concerned of? No. Um, no. The reality is... Uh, uh, the, it takes a long time. So when you say you applied for your wife's PR, um, I'm assuming this is a spousal sponsorship maybe. If it's a spousal, that can take a while to get an acknowledgement of receipt, especially now. If it's express entry, well, you're, if you filed your EAPR, you get your acknowledgement almost instantaneously. So um, yeah, so that's that one. Um, <clears throat> Okay, Rura says, hello, Mark. I hope you and your family are doing well. I just signed. I don't know if you have answered my email. Oh, I'm not sure. Oh, Rura, I think I did answer your email. I think so. Okay, CC says, hello, Mark. My EEPR application is in process, and I recently got an update and found out nothing has been initiated after three months of submission. Should I be worried? Nope, you shouldn't. No one should. Processing times are going to just continue to climb and climb, so no one no one needs to expect that anything is going to happen quickly. Um, <clears throat> okay. Raul says, Does need, do you need to select yes or no under accompanying a family member who has status in Canada while applying for a spousal work permit? If both of us are in Canada on individual post-graduation work permits, if you're talking about listing someone as non-accompanying within an express entry application and you're both in Canada, whether you're on independent work permits or, or whatever, um, yeah, if you're both on individual postgrad work permits, you just need to be able to make sure that you can articulate and clearly justify or explain why you would. Um, uh, well, let's see. I'm trying to. This is where the challenge is. Once I reach a certain stage, which right now we've been going for oh about an hour and a half. I think I'm going to have to wrap this up because my brain is officially taxed. And I know there's a lot more that have posted questions. Um, once again, uh, I'll back to your your question, Raul. Um, uh, do you need to select yes or no under accompanying a family member who has status in Canada while applying for a spousal work permit? Yeah, I would. Absolutely. Um, even if both of you are, yes, you are listing them as accompanying. Yes. Even if you're both in Canada right now. Okay. All right. So like I was indicating here, we're at about an hour and a half and I think we need to wrap it up now. Those of you who I've not yet had a chance to get to your question, 
<clears throat> I think what I'm going to do is in two days time, and Igor, you'll have to remind me and we'll wedge it in. Uh, on Thursday of this week, I will have another Canadian Immigration Live Q&A right here on the Canadian Immigration Institute. I'm going to do another one. And so if you didn't get your questions answered last time, um, uh, just join me next Thursday, seven, same time. So that's basically two days from now, I believe. Everything's a blur for me. So two days time, <clears throat> we'll do another live Q&A and and um, We'll do it right here at the same place, Canadian Immigration Institute. If you have questions in advance, you can send them here. Continue to put EE Live Q&A in the subject line and send them to info at holthylaw.com. Mauricia, the client intake representative for our firm, will screen it out <clears throat> and determine if it's something that's general in nature. It can be about anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be about express entry. And I'll let Mauricia know that. And then we will consider some of the top of those questions in the next live Canadian Immigration Q&A. And uh, for those of you who are watching this as a recording, thanks so much for tuning in to this long, long one. Hopefully you were able to find a question that related to what you were looking for. But if not, remember, you know where to send an email or join me live right here on the Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook page. And um, thanks for being here. Those of you, once again, who've tuned in um, and have stuck it out to the very, very end, I want to thank you for your support and wish you guys all safety and health as we navigate this crazy world of COVID-19. Take care, everyone.